had that had some local men in it, but primarily there were people from across the Mid South. And so when they came to Alexandria, I always it was always kind of curious to me as to why why Alexandria is opposed to someplace else. But Alexandria, if you think about it, think of its location. Number one, it's on the what I would refer to as the safe side of the Cumberland River, yet it's close to the Cumberland River. So, of course, uh, Rosecrans' men, Ambrose Burnside's men up in Kentucky, getting across the river would give uh, anybody concern and trouble, although Morgan was able to solve that problem uh, in, during that period of time over at Hartsville very well. He got across the river and it made a tremendous surprise upon the garrison there. And we all know that story. But that was all in that time frame following the withdrawal of the Confederate Army from Kentucky. But Morgan uh, used this place to launch a very important raid, probably his most successful raid. And that was the one in December of 1862 known as the Christmas Raid. This is, as a matter of fact, this one, uh, our sign kind of covers that one up, but uh, on December 21st of 1862, Morgan left here, but he had to do some things before he could leave. Hey, come on in, we're glad to have you. Thanks for coming up. Before uh, he could undertake such a thing as to another state, go 500 miles and uh, take on very heavily fortified uh, positions, you had to do some things to get ready for that. I've often thought Alexandria must have had some attributes that made that attractive to a, a cavalry division the size of Morton, because when he left here in December of 62, it was the largest command he ever commanded, either before or after. He had over 3,000 uh, horsemen here. And so to be able to organize and get reorganized, be able to make uh, a trip like that, you had to have a lot of fodder, uh, feed for the horses, because we talk about the men, but every man had a horse, and and some of the uh, artillery had to have several horses and be able to make that trip. So that's a lot of fodder, and this area is about as far you can, you're going to run out of fodder if you go much east up here, at least at that time, because most of the good farming in Cab County was in the section that was in the central basin and not on the Highland Rim. So this area here, uh, before the advent of fertilizer and that sort of thing, was the bread basket of it. And of course Morgan needed to be out of striking distance from where? Where were the Federals based in December of 62? Uh, they, they were in Nashville. So he's a good 50 miles outside of Nashville. He's south of the river, and you don't have to worry about much coming from the Knoxville area. So this area here, when you look at it logically in a military fashion, is probably a good place as you could be. So he chose it, and it was a risky endeavor to think about going all the way to Kentucky. What was his objective? What was the military reason for going to Kentucky from Alexandria in, in 62? Well, as we mentioned, the Federal Army was in Nashville. How was it supplied? And where was it supplied from? It was supplied from Louisville, Kentucky, up on the Ohio River, and it was connected to Nashville with what? The l and n Railroad. Still that same railroad bed that uh, still used today. So if you can uh, diminish that supply train and that supply uh, 
channel and eliminate it, you can do a lot to help General Bragg's army, which is now in Murfreesboro. And of course, some people have been critical of the decision to let Morgan go into Kentucky at that time because at the very time he was leaving here in December of 62, what was Rosecrans planning on doing from Nashville? Plan on using the other railroad coming to the southeast toward Chattanooga and head toward Murfreesboro. So that meant Morgan's gone and Bragg's army is diminished to some extent by not having the eyes and ears uh, available. And of course, think uh, also where was General Forrest at this time? So William Forrest could do all that. Well, what was Forrest doing? He was off on his own Christmas raid and he was out in uh, Western Tennessee and, and uh, Western Kentucky out doing a similar thing, trying to disrupt the supply chain coming down the Tennessee River uh, and in that area that was uh, getting supplies to the federal troops. So, Bragg was pretty well without his cavalry, the biggest number of them, but there's also a lot of big advantages. If he can stop that, if he can uh, stop the trains from coming into Nashville on a daily basis, that does a lot to keeping the Army in Nashville and the Union Army from going anywhere because they've got to have supplies to do it. So with all of that thought in mind, you also got to look a little bit at Morgan and what was going on with him. In December 21 of 62, what had just happened personally in Morgan's life? He just gotten married. He married Martha Reedy from over right in the edge of uh, Cannon County, there at the Readable Mill. If you've ever been there, it's open. I'd encourage you to go and eat some pancakes there. It's a great place to eat now. They've restored it. And the, the corners, the house that Martha Reedy lived in is still there, and it's uh, used for public events and things like that now. But anyway, Morgan had married her, and he brought her to Alexandria, basically for their honeymoon. Uh, the, the house that they stayed in is just was just beyond the, uh, the grocery store there and beyond the tree line up there. That house was there in the 60s, I remember it, back during the, uh, the centennial days. Uh, they posted a Confederate soldier there, a mannequin of one, uh, for a period of time, and to mark the fact that this was the house that Morgan stayed in. Now, that house has since been torn down, but it was, a, it was a modest home, but it was a nice home too. So she stayed there, and before they decided to go, and before they actually undertook the raid into Kentucky, we'll talk about it a little more. I suspect the general wanted to kind of impress his young bride on the uh, condition, quality. Hey, mom, of any other grand in. reviews that would have rivaled it, except maybe the one Stuart had in Virginia uh, back before the invasion of uh, Pennsylvania and before Gettysburg. That's the only thing that I know that might have rivaled it. There is a uh, uh, artist's rendition of that parade and, uh, and grand review uh, that's been drawn up. There's a copy of it in the library that the Sons of Confederate Veterans have uh, donated over there. And uh, there's one in the courthouse. And so there, there's some around in the community. But in my opinion, it doesn't do it justice because this review was one uh, with all of the uh, horse squadrons broken into companies and with flags and even had bands and they had this in a very logical and military way. I don't know exactly where that was done. I expect it was over in the fairgrounds area and at that time that would have been just over east of where the current fairgrounds is on the opposite side of the road is my understanding of the location of where 
where that the fairgrounds was, but it would have been an open area and suitable for that. It could have been here along the square is a part of it. They may have paraded through here, but in any event, it was a big affair done in the wintertime. And that was, would be different than Stewart's big uh, one, which was done in the summer. So I don't know that everybody would have been, that's why I think it might have been to show off to his wife. To have one in the, really the middle of the winter, <laughs> I doubt if the soldiers were really looking forward to that. You know, it would not have been one of the things that they would have thought uh, would have been the best use of their time. But, but anyway, it happened. And in preparation for that, the objective of the raid was to go up, destroy as much of the l &N Railroad as possible, but with the ultimate objective being the large trestles, two wooden trestles about 800 feet in length that were north of Elizabeth, uh, uh, Elizabethtown, Kentucky. And if you could put those wooden trestles to flame and destroy those, uh, that that was more than taking out a few stream crossings, stream bridges, and that that could be repaired in a day or two. If you get those trestles down, it's going to take a long time uh, to get those back up in order. And of course, the Federals were uh, understanding of all of that. They knew that that would be an objective, and they weren't. Uh, they did their own military planning as well and did it effectively. So in all of these places where there were, uh, that was on the railroad that had bridges, trestles, there were at least um, small garrisons there, or blockhouses as they were often called. And they were generally manned with units about a company size unit, 75, 50 to 100 men, 75, 80, 90. And they primary duty was to keep anyone from burning the trestles and destroying the railroad track. Well, when Morgan left here, he knew to be successful, he had to travel light. And from my understanding, what they, what they actually took with them when they left was they took a, a blanket, wintertime, they took their weapons, Took some ammunition. They were allowed to take two horseshoes, 12 nails, an oilcloth, and an overcoat. And that's all they left with. They didn't take any wheeled um, wagons with them. The only wheels they took with them were uh, under the artillery. And they took seven pieces of artillery with them, at least a couple mountain howitzers, and I'm not sure what all else they had in the way of ordnance. Typically, they'd have a three-inch ordnance rifle and a, and a couple mountain howitzers and, uh, because they were the most effective against these blockhouses that they'd be seeing. Morgan had learned on his first raid that you had better have artillery or you're going to be spending all your time trying to take out these, these little forts along the way. And most of the time with artillery, you could throw a few shells inside or sometimes just showing the fact that you had artillery and those, those facilities would surrender. Then you could go about destroying and burning uh, the trestles, the bridges, and tearing up the railroad. But as long as those blockhouses were there, you couldn't get much, you couldn't do that effectively. So he took his artillery with him and he starts making his way up the uh, up the L and N. And Rosecrans was was limited because at that time Confederate art, uh, cavalry was certainly superior to the in both in numbers and ability and, uh, and uh, so when. Morgan left here, went to Carthage, gets across the river, starts making tracks to uh, E-Town, Kentucky. He's, he's moving fast because in 14 days he covered 500 miles and he's up, uh, up there and, and back in that period of time. 
So he's moving very fast. He could, was as light as his men were, were uh, equipped. And he's inching his way and making his way up and getting uh, nearer to E Town, where the, or Elizabeth Town, where those uh, long trestles were. And he, in fact, gets there. Now, before he left, General Hardy said what he was doing was impossible. General Breckinridge, who was very familiar with Kentucky, having hailed from there and representing it in the, in the United States uh, government, he says he didn't think it could be done because it was, in fact, well garrisoned and, and they predicted that Morgan would try to do it. So they were prepared for it and had seven, eight hundred man garrisons up there. Not a little hundred man garrison, but had a whole. Um, whole uh, uh, brigade sized group there defending those trusses. But he was able to get up there, made the, uh, uh, made the uh, assault, they surrendered, and of course, one of the little interesting things about it, one of the groups that was garrisoned it was a group of the 71st Indiana that they had already captured once before in a previous raid and of course being winter time uh, the Federals were well provisioned in their uh, facilities there so Morgan's men uh, decided to take the old cloths of blankets and overcoats that the Federals had and his uh, chief of communications uh, Mr. Ellsworth Lightning as he was known got on the, uh, the, uh, the telegraph sent a message back to the governor of Indiana, uh, remembering still that they'd captured this group before and told them, our governor, we, we appreciate all of the blankets and all the overcoats that you've sent us. Uh, next time, I'd suggest it'd be easier for you if you just sent the overcoats and the blankets and just leave the men up in Indiana. <laughs> and, he saw, I don't know if the governor saw the humor in that or not, but uh, that, was, that was the message that woke him up not long after Christmas. And so Morgan, successful. Rosecrans, of course, is trying to trap him. But the problem with that, the method that Rosecrans had at his disposal was the only way he could really do that was with infantry sent out of Nashville on the railroad. So Morgan, started destroying they didn't start destroying the railroad because it got to about Mumfordville and so the Federals could get up as far as Mumfordville and they could kind of block one door and but infantry just couldn't move fast Morgan didn't have much trouble really in getting back. They tried to block him from getting back into Tennessee, but uh, it wasn't effective because they didn't have enough mobility. And Morgan was able to make the return, and as the monument mentions, was it finished the raid in Smithville. That's where he ended up, and with a very small loss of men, and with a great benefit. And of course, while that was going on, as he was coming back, what was going on in our neighborhood, uh, in the general neighborhood, the Battle of Murfreesboro. It didn't go as well for the Confederates at Murfreesboro. So the Southern press emphasized that what Morgan had done during Christmas didn't mention so much the fact that Bragg had, had fought the battle, it was of course in there. He had withdrawn not long after that to Shelbyville on the line along the Duck River and along the edge of the Highland Rim. That was not the story. The story was the fact that Morgan had destroyed all of this. It was very positive and helped keep the morale of the South up. And of course, that's what Morgan was the very best at. Because he was uh, he was a self promoter to some extent. Well, I, don't, I won't deny that, but uh, he was uh, effective at it, and he enjoyed and reveled in that. He 
he was not so much the stand up uh, tradition. He did not use cavalry in its traditional use uh, as much. He was he, he did do it, but he was more effective in, as an independent uh, guerrilla partisan type unit and going back to home to Kentucky where he wanted to be anyway. So that was the first half of the time that Morgan spent in Alexandria was centered in and around and about that Christmas raid. By, but he didn't, he, but he stayed on through the there after his return back. And from there, he kind of guarded all the passes as best he could from the probes from the Union Army trying to find a way to get to Chattanooga. That was his duty. Now, Snow Hill was one uh, area, the area over around Bradyville and in Cannon County, that was another. So he always had men posted along there, and some of them were here in Alexandria um, as well. And that was boring duty for a man like <laughs> John Hunt Morton. It was important duty, but it didn't really interest him. And during that time, he planned and conceived an idea of doing what no one would think possible or would even consider militarily, and that was to make an expedition across the Ohio River into Indiana. Of course, there's some military reasons for doing that. Of course, it disrupt the supply chain, but it was more for psychological reasons that Morgan wanted to do that. Uh, there were, particularly in southern Indiana and southern Ohio, there was a large group of people that were Confederate sympathizers there. They were known as Copperheads, and it, there was speculation that they would join the Confederate cause if given the opportunity to do that. Uh, it turned out not to be the case, but at least there was that belief. But uh, that was an extremely risky undertaking. Anybody uh, can, could see that. And when Morgan would talk about that, he would be rebuffed. You can't do that. But he was given, given the opportunity, he would uh, press General Bragg for an opportunity to go into Kentucky. Uh, he finally convinced the general of, that what he had done in December kept the railroad closed for about five to six weeks. And the Federals are still trying to get down to Chattanooga. They're getting stronger every day because of the supplies coming south. Let's go get the railroad again. They've got it back and running. Let's destroy it. So he did talk Bragg into doing that. And so by June, General um, Morgan is concentrating, getting his cavalry after, uh, consolidated back from all these little areas and gaps they've been patrolling, getting them back to Alexandria, getting them outfitted again, getting them uh, uh, in shape again, because they've had hard duty. I mean, it, they've been fighting uh, since the raid into to Kentucky. They've been fighting the battle at Milton, which didn't go well for Morgan's men. It was a high casualty uh, event for them. It wasn't a hit and run tactic. It was a let's let's go charge some infantry, and it didn't work out too well for them. And Battle of Snow Hill that didn't work out as planned because his men were kind of exposed there on those ridges and. The, Union artillery could take uh, take aim and hit those positions, and they just couldn't hold it with that, plus the fact they got outflanked going up uh, Dry Creek. So uh, that didn't go too well for him. So this, this kind of uh, everyday cavalry duty is not that much fun. Let's go on a horse ride, and let's head to Kentucky. So he finally talked Bragg into that. Uh, all the while, planning to go on into 
Indiana and Ohio. That was not told to Bragg. So anyway you look at it, Morgan's Act was an act of insubordination at the very least. And, but it didn't deter him from doing it. So of course we all kind of know that story once once he left Alexandria, and of course several places claimed to be the kickoff point from uh, which that great Indiana Ohio rate took place. You'll see some maps. Some maps will show it in Sparta. And the reason for that is when he left Alexandria, uh, Bragg did get word to him that there was a, uh, seemed to be a fame coming down from eastern Kentucky into Knoxville, and that he needed to go up there and help stop that. Well, they got part of the way there, and that turned out to be a false alarm. So in about Sparta, he turned back north and went on into Kentucky from there. So that's the reason you see Sparta sometime. And on other maps, you'll see McMimble as being the place that the raid actually started from. That was technically the headquarters of uh, Morgan's division. But where it actually, where the hoof left started hitting the pavement, they started from right here. And they were, no doubt would have been camping in the fairgrounds area, the area north of here, and they're with groups that size. Uh, they're probably all along the creek, you know, open areas where you would, you'd have to have a lot of water to water for that many horses. So I, I suspect you'd have seen all along the creek, there would have been hundreds of cavalrymen stretched from here to out past Don and Wilma Irvin's, I suspect, where they used to live, out the edge of the city limit. I know as a child, I found a dropped uh, uh, mini ball in the creek uh, in the little sandbar that probably was from that time. They would have been, and they wasn't a fired one around, it had been dropped. So all along the, the creek, there would have been uh, plenty of soldiers, and they left here. They were like, uh, uh, armed and equipped when they left because they had to be. They were going to make this one fast. And of course, we won't go into all of the, we don't have time to talk about all the Ohio and Indiana raid. That's not the purpose of it. But the purpose is to show Alexandria's connection to General Morgan. Now, all of the South, the people in the South, loved John Hunt Morgan. They respected him because he gave them something that they didn't have all the time. He gave them hope. He gave them some encouragement. And that's, um, when you're undertaking something as difficult as a, as a war among brothers, you need some hope along the way. And Morgan was good at that. Um, he wasn't always the one to follow the orders to the letter, but he he saw his purpose as a little different than others. But many of the regular soldiers did not think that much of John Hunt Morgan. There was a letter from our own Colonel Goodner to one of uh, his relations here in town, female relations. And he is responding to a letter he received Virginia, where he was there with the 7th Tennessee and, and Company A, being from uh, this area, uh, mostly out of Born of Alexandria men. Kevin's ancestor was in that unit. I had ancestor in that unit. And she was giving the accolades of General Morgan in the letter to her Lieutenant Colonel uh, friend and relation. He didn't think much of it. She was saying things to the effect that he was, you know, a gallant, all the Morgan men are gallant men, and they're uh, very much, uh, I'm always pleased to be in their company. Well, the Colonel had a different view on it. He said, listen, I know how these type men work. They will come in and they will gain your affection but it's the first time the Yankees show up, they get on their horse and they leave town. And then you pay the price for it. They burn your houses, they burn your barns, they steal your horses. 
So all of these things was what uh, was a, the other side to John Hunt Morgan that uh, may be a more reasoned. Welcome, gentlemen. Come on in. Yeah, glad to have you. And when we have these. When you have these type of people in here, they're by definition mobile. They aren't here to hold anything. And when trouble comes, they will leave and you will bear the brunt of it. So uh, I just mentioned that to uh, say that while Alexandria was used as a staging ground, I, I'd say another reason aside from its location and the fact that you had fodder here and water for the horses, I would also contend that the local populace uh, supported them. They gave them what they needed, gave them what they, uh, um, moral support, whatever that they had that they could give to support the cause, it was done, uh, is evidence in these uh, letters that were written. And beyond that, uh, the raid of course ended poorly, the Great Indiana Ohio Raid ended poorly a uh, few, maybe 500 or so, were able to make it across the Ohio River. Uh, the bulk ended up going up uh, when they couldn't get across the river because the gunboats were blocking their way. Uh, they're at the edge of West Virginia and eastern, um, uh, southeastern Ohio. They, uh, a good number of them found their way back 500 of them or so and they ended up uh, joining back with confederate forces and many of them were in uh, Chickamauga which happened later in the summer and the remainder with Morgan were captured uh, in northern uh, Ohio about a hundred miles from Lake Erie so I mean that talk about a long horse ride that was a long horse ride from here to about a hundred miles from Lake Erie and they ended up spending time in prison until they broke prison. But really, after the first raid we spoke of, the Christmas raid, that was pretty much the, uh, that was Morgan's high point. And uh, some attribute it to his marriage, that maybe he was more interested in his life. I don't know about that. I, I think that's quite a bit of speculation there. I think as much had much to do with anything was the fact that Federals were getting better in their cavalry arm and there were, uh, they was getting larger in number and experience and it just was a harder job to do than it was the first two years of the war. Well with that in mind, do anybody have any questions about Alexandria and its connection to John Hunt?